Hi, and good evening once again to Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Spring Lake Park. I'm Pastor Gelbach, pastor of the Deaf Congregation, Prince of Peace Lutheran Church for the Deaf, also here in Spring Lake Park. Uh, we're continuing our Wednesday evening Bible study on the book of Psalms, and we are up to Psalm 34. And this is where we ended up last time, going into 34 a little bit, but tonight we're going to go back and kind of restart from the beginning a little bit, bring in a little bit more of the background story behind this psalm. The psalm begins with this title, Of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, so that he drove him out and he went away. Last time I explained this referred to uh, David going into the land that was ruled by Abimelech and, uh, and feigning madness in order to escape because he was fearful of what the situation is. The full story can be found in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 10 through 15. And the person who's in charge of the city was a man by Achish. He is the king of Gath. And here's what it says. David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. So we have this person, Achish, the king of Gath. But then we also have this psalm referring to the same event, calling him Abimelech. You know, why would, they, why would they do that in Psalm 34? You know, change the name as it were. Well, the term Abimelech means the father is king. The father is king. This functions more as a title rather than a formal name. Uh, we use the term sire in the English language. Among those who live under a monarchy will call a king sire as a word of respect, even though there is no biological connection. They are not physically the sons of or daughters of the king. So they will give that kind of honorific to the king because he is the protector, he is the head of state, he is the one who is looking out for the welfare of his people that he, that he rules. And so we have that. And so that is why we have the term Abimelech in Psalm 34, as opposed to referring to him by name. They're using the title rather than the formal name of Achish, the king of Gath. And so that's the background situation there. David goes to Gath. He is there. The servants of Achish recognize David and say, you, you know who this person is, right? This is the person that they sing, Saul killed his thousand, David killed his ten thousands. And of course, Achish becomes very suspicious. David hears what they're saying. His identity is going to be blown by these servants. And David decides to feign madness. He starts to he starts to talk gibberish. He talks, starts to write on the walls, walk around. He lets the spit drip through his beard. And that convinces the king that David is no more than a madman. And so the king says, why should I have a madman here? Send him away. And that's how David escaped from this perilous situation. He engaged in a form of deceit by feigning to be mad in order to convince the king to send him away unharmed. And so we have this situation as far as you know, David escaping. And so this psalm is referring to that incident. And so we'll see more about this and how it connects a little later in the psalm as we go. So let's go back to verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Here we have this connection between blessing and praising. The idea of blessing the Lord is the same as praising the Lord. Verse 2 says, My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. The idea of my soul making its boast in the Lord. This last Sunday, uh, which was the baptism of our Lord, the epistle lesson St. Paul wrote a, a, a statement saying, 
Let he who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Let he who boasts, boast in the Lord. In other words, boasting is saying, I have confidence in this person. So when someone boasts on themselves, they're saying, I have confidence in myself. But when we boast on the Lord or we boast on somebody else, we're saying, I put my confidence in him. I trust him. And so for the Christian, we're not to boast on ourselves. God has taken away every reason for us to boast. So if we must boast, then we ought to boast in the Lord. If we have confidence in our life, then our confidence should be placed in the Lord. And so here, the idea of boasting, putting one's trust in the Lord, uh, looking to him for help and for, for deliverance. Let the humble hear and be glad. The humble of heart the, are the ones who should be glad because they're the ones whom who are trusting the Lord. They're the ones that the Lord cares for, and so they trust him. And then David adds again, O oh, magnify the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. He now invites the worshipers, invites those who are singing or chanting this psalm to join him in magnifying the Lord. Again, another word for praising him magnifying, making him bigger and bigger through the praise. Not that we increase God, but to make, his, make our confession of him bigger and bigger. And so we exalt his name together. The idea of, of praising God is not simply an isolated thing that we do as Christians, but something that we ought to be doing corporately as well when we gather in worship especially. So David is saying, let's praise the Lord. Let's magnify him. Let's boast in him. And then he gives us the reason. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. The Lord rescued David. The Lord cared for him. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. Those who look to the Lord for help, those who look to the Lord for salvation, those who look to the Lord for protection, it's as if their face glows because they are looking to the Lord. They're being very joyful in their anticipation of what the Lord will do for them. And they are never, never ashamed if they trust the Lord. Verse 6, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. This poor man, David, he's confessing his unworthiness as a poor man and yet God deigned to rescue him and deliver him from all of his troubles. And so David is giving gratitude to the Lord. This is his reason to give thanks to the Lord for the Lord has heard him, cared for him, and rescued him. And then verse 7 has this very beautiful promise. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. The angel of the Lord. This is a phrase that refers to a theophany, to an appearing of God uh, for people to see in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord appeared to Abraham and the appear, angel appeared to others as well. And they all recognized that this was God appearing to them and speaking to them in this, in this form of an angel. And so they recognized this is God appearing and being there. And so David is saying the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. We see examples of how God has put his protection around his people, especially in the Exodus, when God is protecting his people. He guards them as the Egyptian armies are set to capture them at the edge of the Red Sea. The angel, God himself, puts the pillar of fire between them. He encamps around them, protects them. 
and gives them an opportunity to escape and then also destroys the Egyptian army afterwards when they try to chase after the children of Israel. We see this again later on in the, in the time of the prophets, in the later time of Israel, where, where God sends angels to surround a city and protect it. Again and again, God is around his people, protecting them. As David often uses the idea of God as a fortress, one whose four walls are surrounding us and keeping everyone inside safe. And this is where we want to be, safe within the care of the Lord. Those who fear him, those who honor him, those who believe him, who trust him, he will deliver them. He will rescue them. He surrounds them with himself. And then in verse 8, we had this very beautiful verse. O taste and see the Lord is good. Experience him. See his saving work and see that it is good. The Lord himself is good good. And we talk about tasting and seeing here in the Lord's Supper, don't we? We come and by faith we see and know that the bread and the wine are indeed the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, given and shed for the forgiveness of sins. And then what do we do? We eat and drink. We taste. Here we have an example of seeing and tasting the Lord and seeing that is good. Why? Because there we find the forgiveness of sins, life and salvation, which our Lord graciously poured out upon us from his cross and offers to us through his body and blood in, with, and under the bread of wine. And so taste and see the Lord is good. Let our experiences of his goodness overwhelm us. Take an opportunity to trust him. Try it. Trust him and see that he is good. He continues, blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So blessed is the person who finds his refuge in the Lord, who takes refuge with him. The idea of God saving those who trust him, rescuing those who trust him. Sometimes the difficult thing is that we experience our troubles in our life here. We do trust the Lord, but it, sometimes it seems like the troubles go on and on and on. And yet maybe those troubles aren't what we need to be rescued from. Perhaps there is something greater, much more severe, of which we must be protected, particularly those things which do affect our eternal salvation, things that are offered to us by the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. You know, not simply the physical things, but the spiritual struggles and spiritual temptations, the spiritual fighting that goes on as our enemies try to stop us from trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Verse 9, O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. Those who trust in the Lord lack nothing. Indeed, we don't. We may be without food for a short time. We may be without water. We may be alone and isolated for a while due to COVID or some other situation. But truly, when we look at our lives, we lack nothing. We trust in the Lord because he gives us the one thing that he alone gives us, salvation, right? And when we have salvation in the Lord, when we have our eternal welfare taken care of, it doesn't matter what happens in our life here. If we trust the Lord, we lack nothing. Verse 10, the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. David is emphasizing this and putting in a contrast at this point. 
young lions. He says, young lions suffer want and hunger. If you've ever watched um, the Animal Planet or, or the Discovery Channel and watched uh, programs that deal with wild cats like lions, the big cats, uh, they'll talk about them, the younger lions, they don't have the hunting skills yet that the more mature lions do. And so they go out and they try on their own to hunt and kill, they often fail. They learn to depend upon the pride, they learn to band together and work together for the common good of the pride. And they learn from, particularly from the the mother, the, tiger, the, the lioness, she is primarily teaching them how to hunt, how to care for themselves. But when they go out on their own, they often are hungry because they haven't quite learned the skills yet to properly hunt. And so describing young lions as being hungry is like describing David's enemies. These people are going about thinking of themselves prideful and important and, and thinking they can do these things. They're strong, they're lions. But because they don't trust in the Lord, they go hungry. They go hungry. Verse 11. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So David goes from praising God, he goes from explaining the reason for his praising of God, he goes to the encouragement that those who trust the Lord, the Lord protects and cares for. Then he continues and says, children, listen to me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Now David is becoming the teacher, the instructor, instructing those who are chanting, singing, or listening to this psalm what it means to fear the Lord. Verse 12. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? A rhetorical question. Everyone, they want to have a long life and they want to see good in their life. That is a common human desire that we all have. We want the good life. We want the long life with all the goodness of this world. And then he goes on to say, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. He gives advice on how to live life in the world as one who trusts in the Lord. And it's almost a self-reflection here because what does he say in here? He says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. What did David do? What did David do to Achish, king of Gath? He deceived him. He feigned madness in order to protect himself. And in this psalm, David is reflecting on that and is reflecting on how it went and was saying we aren't to be deceitful. We're not to be lying or have lying lips. But we are to be honest and upright in all that we say and do here in the world. We're to turn away from evil and do good. It's not simply a matter of just ignoring certain kinds of evil. But the idea here is that we are to turn away from everything that is evil and do all that is good. We are to seek out and do good. We can't simply be neutral. This is not simply avoiding evil, but we also have to be doing good. Doing good. Seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace with other people. David is a man of war. He was running for his life from Saul, who was trying to kill him. He had 
because of his visiting of certain priests in another city, Saul killed those priests because they had helped David to escape. Saul's viciousness and vindictiveness against David was increasing and increasing. David himself is a man of war, a man surrounded and caught up in violence. And he says, seek peace and pursue it. Don't simply wait here for peace to happen, but be an active doer in the seeking and accomplishing of peace. In other words, David is saying we can't check out of life. We can't simply retreat into our little fortress and sit there and wait. We are in the world. We must be engaged in the world as God's people. And we must seek and do good. We must pursue and seek peace. We simply cannot live our lives neutral in the matter when it comes to our life in the world. We must actively eschew evil and pursue good and do good. So this is what the one who trusts in the Lord, one who fears the Lord, ought to do. Not to retreat in fear of what the world offers, but to be bold in doing God's will for this world. Verse 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. Again, a promise that God is looking upon the righteous, and he hears their cries. He is not blind or deaf to our situation. The world sees us struggle and mocks us and says, where is your God? In fact, St. Peter writes that people mock Christians because Christ has promised to return, but he hasn't come back yet. And Peter has to say, but the Lord is not slow as the world counts slowness. For with God, a thousand years is as a day. And so the world is going to mock us when it sees us suffering in this world and says, where is your God now? Why isn't he helping you now? Maybe he's forgotten you. Maybe he's blind or deaf. Maybe he's moved to another galaxy and is worrying about those people there. And he's just kind of ignoring us. But the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous his ears are toward their cry. He sees and hears his people. Verse 16. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. So the face of the Lord, he is against those who do evil. He's set against them. He's drawn his line in the sand and says, you will move no more. And he fights against evil. He fights against the evil in this world. Although it may seem like it's not happening, struggle and conflict pops up again and again. Sometimes it feels like it's getting more and more. But God is dealing with evil in his own way, in his own time. He is like some of these people who set up dominoes. They make all these intricate designs. They have them all set up. God's getting everything set up, and then all of a sudden, he hits the domino, and everything falls into a place and accomplishes what he wants to do. But it may take time for God to set these things up. He's going to put them in the right place at the right time so everything fits together according to his good and gracious will. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. So in contrast to the Lord opposing those who do evil, he listens to the cry of those who need him, the righteous, and he delivers them out of all their troubles. David is reflecting personally, isn't he? He cries to the Lord, and the Lord rescues him again and again from Saul's clutches. 
again and again from death and defeat. God is rescuing David. Then verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The brokenhearted, the crushed in spirit. Those who have felt their lives overwhelmed, those who have felt spiritually and emotionally beat up, who simply feel like they can't go on day by day by day. Yet the Lord is near those people. You consider your own personal experiences. There are times when you have felt overwhelmed by situations in your life, overwhelmed by the troubles and problems that you face, and yet you are reminded again and again that the Lord is there for you. He comforts you. He gets you through those difficult times in your life. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Again, that repeated refrain, the righteous suffer, yes, the righteous struggle, yes, but the Lord delivers him from all of these things. And the Lord does, and the Lord will for us. We live and struggle in this world. We are in the world, but not of the world. We belong to Christ, and for his sake, the world opposes and hates us. We live here and we struggle and we wonder and ponder our future. But the Lord will come and deliver us all, ultimately in the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. There he will rescue us from the final enemy, death. He will give us life through faith in Jesus Christ and he will raise us from the dead to live with him. There we find the ultimate healing. There we find the ultimate comfort. For the brokenhearted, for those with crushed spirits, for those who suffer afflictions and troubles in their life, there is a day when those things will be gone may not happen in our lifetime here, but we have God's promise, we have his assurance that trusting in Jesus Christ, we will overcome all things. Christ has overcome them all for us, and he will raise us from the dead to life everlasting. The Lord delivers the righteous, and in verse 20, it says he keeps all of his bones and not one of them is broken. Certainly used prophetically to describe you know, our Lord Jesus Christ. His bones were not broken as, as it was, didn't happen to him on the cross. They saw he was dead and so they didn't break his bones as they would break the bones of, other, of the others. So he keeps all of his bones, not one of them is broken. The Lord is protecting the righteous. Afflictions will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. In the last judgment, Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep, eternal life. The goats, eternal damnation. In this way, God will slay the wicked. He will give them eternal death. Those who hate the righteous, God condemns. And there will be that final condemnation for those people who hate Jesus, who hate the righteous. And then the final uh, verse, uh, verse, excuse me, not the final verse, but um, yeah, verse, the final verse, verse 32. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So those who oppose the righteous will be condemned. But those who take refuge in the Lord, the righteous who trust him, there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who trust the Lord. Why? Because Christ accepted our condemnation. God condemned and punished Christ for our sins. And so all who trust in Jesus Christ, their sins are forgiven. And without sin, there is no condemnation. 
Without condemnation, there is only eternal life for those who trust in Christ. And so we've come to the end here of Psalm 34, a beautiful psalm of David, a psalm that kind of reassures us again and again, yes, that God cares for the righteous, that all who trust in him will not be put to shame. Those who trust in the Lord will not be condemned, but they will have eternal life, eternal life. So let's continue on then with uh, Psalm 35. This is a rather long psalm. Uh, we only have about 12 minutes left in our study. We may not get through it, obviously, but we will come and pick it up next time. The only thing to describe this song is says it's of David, of David. Verse 1, contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. God, be my advocate, be my defender. Fight against those who fight against me. That's our prayer to the Lord. We face our enemies in this world, and we ask God to fight against them for us. We ask him to, to contend against them for us. And we Christians understand that struggle in a very personal way because God has put his spirit within us. And we have that war going on that the flesh is fighting against spirit and the spirit is fighting against flesh. And we ask God's help to fight against our enemies. And ultimately, our sinful flesh is our enemy, as well as the world and the devil. And we ask the Lord to fight against them, to contend against them on our behalf. Why? We cannot defeat them on our own. We don't have the strength to stand on our own against the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. We're going to fail. We need the one whom God has appointed we need the one who is our savior to come and fight alongside us on the plain, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so David is praying to God, the Lord, but we know who the Lord is, Jesus Christ. And so we pray to him for the same thing, to fight against our enemies for us, on our behalf, to help us withstand them. Verse 2, take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. 3, draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. David is saying, Lord, gird yourself for war. Put on your armor, grab your sword, come and fight for me. And remind me. Say to my soul, remind me again that you are my salvation. That you are the one who is coming to save me and rescue me. It's kind of an interesting contrast where Jesus comes. He enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to the praise and adoration of the people who believe he is the coming king to rescue them from Roman rule and establish an earthly kingdom of Israel that will be the preeminent kingdom on earth. Jesus comes, yes, to fight, but he doesn't bring an army. He doesn't draw a sword. Instead, he comes and fights, fights by dying on the cross. He takes up a cross as his weapon against sin, death, and the devil. That is the weapon he uses to save us. And so, just as the Lord is asked to gird himself for fight, Jesus comes and he takes up his cross in order to engage the enemy and fight on our behalf. And his cross declares to us that Jesus is our salvation. Wow. So then he talks about his enemies in verse 4. 
Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Chase his enemies away. Pursue them. Blow them away like chaff. Turn the tables upon them. Defeat them and send them running in fear. Send them packing, as it were. Let their way be dark and slippery. Confuse them. Let them feel their own punishment for their own faults by slipping and sliding in the darkness of their spiritual blindness. And the angel of the Lord, the one who is the protector of Israel, is chasing them and pursuing them, driving them away. So why is David asking for this? Why is he praying this? Verse 7, For without cause they hid their net for me. Without cause they dug a pit for my life. They tried to kill him. They tried to ensnare him. They tried to capture him, humiliate him, shame him. And then he says, Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. And let the net that he hid ensnare him, let him fall into it to his destruction. In other words, let the enemy be caught unaware. Let him stumble and fall in his own trap. Let him be caught up by his own mischief and instigation. Let him entrap himself. Let him fall into it to his destruction. Then verse 9, when this is done, Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you? Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and the needy from him who robs him. We can't defend ourselves. We're poor and needy. There are those around us who are physically stronger than us in this world, who sometimes even seem spiritually stronger than us. And we thank the Lord for delivering us. He rescues us from those people. They free him from those who's too strong for him. The Lord rescues those who are weak, the needy, the poor, the orphan, the widow, the childless. He is there to help them against their oppressors and their enemies. Verse 11. Malicious wit witnesses rise up. They ask me of things that I do not know. His enemies try to entrap him try to get him to admit to something that he know that he doesn't do. They're trying to trap him with his own words, much like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the law teachers and the priests tried to trap Jesus in his own words, tried to get him to say something by which they could condemn him, but they failed. Verse 12, they repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. Jesus asked them, For what good deed do you condemn me? And they say, We don't condemn you for your good deeds. They repay him evil for good. My soul is bereft. David is just so overwhelmed, so, so put upon so oppressed that it weighs heavy on his soul. But I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. When his enemies were sick, Jesus, David prayed for them. He said, I prayed with my head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. 
as one who laments for his mother, I bow down in mourning. David humbled himself and prayed for his enemies. When they were afflicted and suffering, he prayed for them, wished them well, asking God to care for them. But what do they do in return? Verse 15. But as my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered. They gathered together against me. One little mistake, one of my failures, or even the, the, my prayers, my faith stumbles, they gather it together against me. Wretches whom I did not know tore at me without ceasing. Even people who didn't know him were coming and assaulting him. Like profane mockers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. They accuse him and accuse him and accuse him. And they ask him questions. He's like, what did I do? You tell me. I have no idea what you're talking about. And, but they kept up doing it, even when they did not have the grounds to do so. They did not have any reason to bring up any charges or accusations against David. But still, they did. Verse 17 how long, O Lord, will you look on? How long will you sit there and wait before you act? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. From the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng I will praise you. These verses really speak to our Christian experience today. We struggle and suffer in this world against enemies, some to whom we have done good. We certainly have, done, have not done evil to them, yet they seek our evil. They seek to harm us, to put us down, to destroy us, destroy our faith. And we wonder, how long, O oh Lord, will you just sit there and wait? How long will it be until you act? How long will you be? Rescue me from their destruction. Lord, rescue us Christians. Rescue us from their destructive actions against us. And then I will thank you in the great congregation in the mighty throng, I will praise you. David is talking about the congregation that he gathers in Jerusalem and worships there with the believers, the great congregation in Jerusalem. But we Christians speak of a great congregation as well, the great congregation that is in heaven. And if we think about that as our great congregation, for us Christians, we take comfort in these words. I will thank you in the great congregation. In the mighty throng, I will praise you. Revelation chapter 7. We see the first vision of heaven. And there is a throng standing before the throne, a mighty crowd that could not be numbered from every tribe and nation and family and language, an innumerable crowd of people and there we will stand within that crowd praising and thanking God because it's very interesting although we will be in this crowd God will see each and every one of us personally Revelation says he will come and wipe every tear from their eye and that is the glorious place that we will be. That is our great congregation where we will stand with the Lord forever. And so we've come about, oh, three-fifths of the way through this Psalm 35. Next week we'll pick up 
here with that psalm and continue on. I want to thank everyone for joining me here this evening for our Bible study. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you always. Amen.